recording in progress. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this month's webinar, Victims of Vesuvius, presented by NACCP, or the North American Cambridge Classics Project, and sponsored by Cambridge University Press. I am really thrilled this evening to introduce to you Natalie Roy. She is going to be our guest presenter. And um, Natalie has done so many wonderful, wonderful things in her career. So let me just tell you a few of those things. Uh, she teaches Latin, Roman technology, and myth makers at Glasgow Middle School in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. A National Board Certified Teacher, Natalie National Studies Classic, and Curriculum Design at Louisiana State University. Her work in the past five years has past focused years on has integrating focused STEM on. and maker education with classics. In 2021, Natalie was named the Louisiana State Teacher of the Year an experience that allowed her to meet President Joe Biden and First Lady Jill Biden at the White House. In recognition of her 30 years working in classics, the American Classical League honored her with the 2022 Merita Award. And that is just a small segment of all of the things that Natalie has been doing during her career. So um, on that note, we welcome you this evening. Thank you so much for being here. And let's talk about the victims of Vesuvius. Thank you all so much for having me. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen now. Uh, we're going to start really with a document that uh, you can use to access everything that I'm going to talk about tonight. It's been linked in the chat already. So if you want to access this as I talk about all the different stuff, feel free to do that. And here it is. So um, let me get this out of the way here. That is kind of, okay. Oops, let me just put it back. Okay. So this whole lesson, y'all, before I even begin uh, talking, uh, was created, was made possible by a grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities. Um, a couple of years ago, I was fortunate enough to do a National um, Endowment for the Humanities seminar called uh, Daily Rome, or Rome, Daily Life in Rome, with Dr. Matt Pansiera and, at, from Gustav, Gustavus um, Adolphus College. And he ran the seminar. It was a three-week seminar that we did over the summer, and it was fantastic. Um, he featured Dr. Rebecca Benefiel, who is the uh, founder of the um, graffiti project, the ancient graffiti project. And it was a wonderful experience. But through that um, workshop, we were asked to kind of come up with a lesson that, you know, we were inspired to uh, dig deeper into. And mine was all about the, um, the victims of Vesuvius. So uh, there were two really, um, really interesting books that I wanted to read. And so I kind of worked those into a project. And one of those was called um, Resurrecting Pompeii. And I hope you can see it. Um, it's linked in my resources page for this lesson. And then the other one was uh, Pompeii's Living Statues by Eugene Dwyer about um, the plaster casts of Pompeii. But Resurrecting Pompeii, which I'll talk a little bit more about, was by Dr. Estelle Laser, a physical anthropologist. So of course, because I teach a class that, is, uh, that centers STEM in the classical world, I wanted to learn more about the plaster casts. So that's how my project kind of started, but then it kind of became something else uh, as, I, as I worked on it. So uh, this is the lesson and feel free, like the lessons I create are just kind of, um, cafeteria style. You just take what you want to use and then, you know, leave out other stuff that you're not comfortable with or that you don't want to use. Um, but if, if I were teaching this lesson, which I do in my Roman technology class, um, I, I do it in this, in this way. So my step one is to have my students watch a phenomenon video. I'm not gonna try to show you that video tonight because I'm pretty sure that my Chromebook that I'm presenting from tonight will break down. But very basically a phenomenon video is just a short video that you show students 
that kind of piques their curiosity about us about a topic. And this one is simply a, a, a short, it's about a minute, minute and a half long about an archeologist who is creating a plaster cast. And they don't really give too much about information about what's happening in the video. You just see this hole that is in the dirt and the archeologist is kind of bending over the hole, pouring something into it. You can see the bones inside the hole. So I like to show that first. Um, and then they uh, watch kind of an overview video, which is linked here in this learn button about Pompeii. Uh, it's at the 32 minute mark of this very old video <laughs> that I find that I found that I always used to show at the very beginning of the year for my Latin classes. And it's just kind of, you know, five minutes about what Pompeii is, what happened, the eruption, that kind of thing. So that's just the step one to introduce the kids to um, the very basic idea of what plaster casts might be, why they were made, what Pompeii is, that kind of thing. The next step is for them to take kind of a tour of the city of Pompeii using Google Earth. Um, and I've, I've got that kind of pulled up to show y'all. So I'm gonna try to click on it right here and see if I can get to it. I'm not, again, I'm not gonna try to attempt to do this on my Chromebook while I'm presenting to you in Zoom. You can go and uh, get this thing on your own. But what I've done is I've created a playlist here of places where you can go in Google Earth in Pompeii to see plaster casts. And the first one is the Antiquarium of Pompeii, which is um, located right there in the forum. And when you click on it, and I hope you don't disappear, so I'm just telling you now, <laughs> uh, but the Antiquarium is uh, right over here. Okay, so I'm pointing to it here. And when you go to over here, if you're looking at the bottom right of my screen, you go to street view, which I'm going to attempt to do if I disappear, I promise you I'll be right back. So when you click on street view in Google Earth, all these blue lines appear where you can actually place yourself in Google Earth and you can um, uh, pretend that you're there. <laughs> it's really amazing. Um, and it allows you to see some of the plaster casts that are housed in the antiquarium. The students love Google Earth and Google Maps because it really does look like you're there. You know, you can place yourself in the forum. <laughs> you can place yourself wherever you want to go um, in Pompeii. So it's kind of cool. All right, next, they go a little bit deeper by learning about the victims of Vesuvius. There are two, I, I do this in kind of two separate presentations. The first one is centers the plaster casts of Pompeii. And the second one centers the skeletal remains uh, found in the boathouses of Herculaneum. So I'll start with Pompeii. And instead of kind of sharing these, y'all, I'm going to make them, I hate to like, okay, I'm going to do this and hopefully this will be a little bit easier for you and me to, to navigate. <clears throat> so just, and I'm just going to say this here, if you need to contact me at any time, um, the best email is listed here. Please follow me on Twitter. I tweet a lot about the stuff that I do in my Roman technology class. And um, my link tree is listed in the um, chat for you. So you can access all this stuff, including this lesson. I also have an, a very um, new article that just came out in Edutopia. It's an online article about um, bringing the voices of history to life through experimental archaeology. So you can check all of that stuff out there. So I'm just going to go to a little trigger warning here before we start. And I, I highly encourage you to do the same if you're going to use this material with your students. Um, sometimes kids get really upset seeing skeletal remains, especially those that are in, you know, positions of extreme duress, as you're going to see here today. So I just like to read this to them. I like them to know that they are going to see things that might disturb them. But I always find that even my youngest students in sixth grade they don't, you know, they can go search this stuff up on their own, you know, um, and find all kinds of things online. So they don't, I don't like to lie to my students. I don't like to sugarcoat things for them. I like to just be honest with them and tell them, you know, you might be upset, 
but it, this is important for you to learn about. So one of the questions students always ask me is how did people of Pompeii die? They know about the, the eruption. So they, you know, they wanna know like what exactly happened. So I like to show them pictures like this so that we can talk about asphyxiation and the sulfuric fumes of the eruption. Um, I allow them to light matches so that they can smell what you know sulfur smells like. It's a very simple thing to do and it's harmless, but it does give them that, that sense of that burning and um, the horror of it without being too harmful. And you can see here this um, plaster cast, the victim is holding his hands over his face, probably trying to protect himself from, um, from the toxic fumes. Although uh, it is now, you know, we're now starting to understand after these plaster casts have been investigated more that many people died of head trauma rather than asphyxiation. Um, these orange tabs that I have in here, they're just kind of things that I want the students to uh, pay attention to. So I have them highlighted. Um, in some versions of this presentation, I actually make the students type in these things so that, you know, they're more engaged as I present. And I'm not going to do that with you tonight because I know that you're <laughs> engaged. <laughs> so um, I like to explain what plaster casts are to the students because they usually they don't understand like what is this thing? Like why does it look this way? How did they make it? They just don't understand how, you know, it worked. Um, and so I, I always have to explain to them so after the body, you know, decomposed, the bones are still in there. That was one of their major, like, where are the bones? <laughs> and so once they understand how they were made, um, we do this little, I show them that the teeth and the skeleton are, and the skull are actually there as part of the cast. And then they do this little activity. We learn, you know, I go through the exact, um, process of how these were created. It's a great little graphic for that. And then they kind of have to uh, label this little diagram with all of these terms. And they can, these things are movable. Again, this is all available to you. So they can move archaeologists over here on the archaeologist. They can learn what a trowel is over here. Um, they can learn what a funnel is and, and just so on. It really helps them to understand how these were made. So um, as I was studying this, um, I started to look into the history of plaster casts and how they were made. And again, Dwyer's book is excellent for that if you're curious about it. But before archaeologists were casting humans, they started by casting inanimate objects like, you know, wooden doors and whatnot. Supposedly, the first to cast humans was the superintendent of the site. Um, I'm sure you've all heard his name, Giuseppe Fiorelli. But there's some argument about did he actually, was he actually the first one? It's kind of like a Schliemann situation, you know, was he the, the one who actually found the jewels? We don't know. We'll probably never know. Uh, but some of the casts actually have no bones uh, inside because the archaeologists took them out before they made the casts. And the casts were stored in a building near the forum of the ancient city. Um, and were all victims made into casts? No. Some skeletons were actually used to impress and entertain famous visitors to Pompeii. Um, the excavators would set the skeletons up in a dramatic way, as you see here so that the visitors could get an unforgettable experience. And here is a drawing of the Emperor of Austria checking out a staged scene uh, on his little tour. Um, I found this stuff really disturbing when I read about it. It bothered me. <laughs> um, and then, of course, we have a very, very important visitor. Um, Edward Bulwer Lytton visited Pompeii in the early 1830s. And he was inspired by the skeletons he saw there, so inspired, in fact, that he wrote the famous story, uh, The Last Days of Pompeii. And as you may know, the book became very famous. It was read all over the world. It helped to make Pompeii the city uh, that is so famous that we know today. 
uh, this shocked me, but lots of people made up stories about the skeletons as they were found, including uh, Bulwer Lytton. But with permission, uh, the writer took home the skull of one of the skeletons that he wrote about, and he kept it in a glass case in his office. The famous Italian director, uh, Roberto Rossellini, filmed a movie featuring Pompeii in 1954. It was called Journey to Italy, and it follows a married couple as they contemplate divorce. And near the end, they view a plaster casting session, which you see here, screenshot, uh, in the middle of the excavation. And when the two bodies are uncovered, uh, the wife becomes too upset to watch. So as you, of course, probably already know, some of the skeletons uh, found are of animals. And I always ask the students, like, why do you think the dog was unable to escape? And if they look closely enough, they can see that he has a, a collar on with a little chain, a little lock. And of course, he's in this tortured position. Now, other types of animals have been found too, including a pig um, and a donkey. In World War II, in 1943, the Allied forces um, bombarded Pompeii with uh, bombs, damaging the area where the plaster casts were stored. And that's, of course, the antiquarium, which I pointed out to you in Google Maps. Uh, the bombing destroyed many of the casts, and it made a mess of the storage building. Many records were lost, too. It also, and this I had never, I never knew, also, it also left behind unexploded bombs, which experts are still looking for, by the way. Um, <laughs> that floored me. Um, so then I asked the students, I show the students this question. Um, people who study the skeletons of dead people are called physical anthropologists. So they study how a person lived and died by examining their bones. So I always ask the students, like, how do you think this person died? And of course, you know, when this photo came out a few years ago, most everyone said, oh, it's kind of obvious, right? This gigantic um, piece of masonry fell on him. Well, of course, that's not actually true. Um, and then I linked them to this article here. We do a lot of reading of scientific articles about Pompeii in this class. And um, he died, he didn't, he probably died of asphyxiation. There was no head trauma when the archeologists were able to fully excavate him. But just making the point that it's important not to make up a story about a skeleton until it's fully, fully studied. And then this is where Dr. Laser enters the picture. Uh, she's an Australian physical anthropologist who is the expert who is studying the victims of Vesuvius in Pompeii and has been for the past couple of decades. Uh, when she started to study the skeleton, she found them in a large room in the suburban baths, and they had been disambiguated, meaning that they had been taken apart. Uh, and it took her many years to organize the skeletons and study them. So to be clear, these are the skeletons that were not cast or pieces of skeletons that were taken from bodies before they were cast um, in Pompeii. And this picture, which is um, featured in the book. It's featured on the cover of her book. It just made me so sad. <laughs> I don't know about y'all, but it, there's just something that deeply bothers me about it. Her work led to something called the Plaster Cast Project. And I have this linked for you in the resources page, but um, she started to study the disarticulated skeletons. Uh, she gathered a team of scientists to study them, and um, she also studied the ones that were trapped inside the plaster casts. So they were scanned, and many of them were found to not even have the bones in there, you know, after all. Some of them either even had metal rods that had been inserted to support the plaster. The most surprising find was that some plaster had been added to give the casts a particular shape, like, for example, a rounder bottom. 
And due to these studies, uh, she began to realize that many of the stories created about the plaster casts were just not based in scientific analysis and were just kind of made up. Um, so you, this is a screenshot from the video at the very beginning that I like to show the students of the physical anthropologist looking into a cavity of the um, volcanic debris and she's about to cast the skeleton. So it helps them to kind of connect the two, how the lesson started and where we are now. And Dr. Laser's studies have led to many interesting conclusions about the people of Pompeii, but her enduring, um, you know, study is really about the ethical concerns about these people's remains and how they were treated. Um, and even up to now, it's an ongoing issue. And we'll talk a little bit more about that when we look at the remains from Herculaneum. But I'll just end with this. Uh, I'm sure many of you know the Lagonium creator, Anthony Gibbons. He created this little uh, Lego uh, Dr. Laser. She's the one in purple. And she's talking about how she had to, you know, reorder the, the bones of this skeleton. So I thought that was pretty cool. Anthony is also Australian. So, okay. So after the students go through that presentation, we hop back over to the one on Herculaneum. And Herculaneum is a little bit of a different story. Um, the people here died in a very different way. And this is something that you're gonna have to decide, you know, like how young are your students? Like how much can they handle? Because what we're about to discuss is pretty gruesome. Um, the people in Herculaneum were spared the, you know, beginning of the eruption, right? They, because of the, the wind flowing uh, southward, they didn't get a lot of that ash and pumice fall that the Pompeians did. So most likely, you know, a lot more of them died. We probably don't know that because as you may know, Herculaneum is, is mostly still underground. It is under the modern city of Ercolano. And so those who stayed probably died of thermal shock and <laughs> thermal shock is, happens due to extreme heat uh, produced by the surges of the um, eruption. And I believe there were seven or five or seven surges that occurred in the 79 eruption. Temperatures could have reached 400, although some scientists think even higher um, than that. And they would have caused instantaneous evaporation of body fluids, uh, such as blood. And they think that the skulls would have exploded. And so you see some skulls here from the, um, the boathouse skeletons showing, you know, this charring that you see on, on B and the explosion that you see with C. Um, the orange color they think is due to evap the iron in blood as it was as it evaporated in this high heat. Um, the death would have been instantaneous. So there's that. That's at least a good thing. But students are often, I find, a little disturbed by this, which, you know, I could understand. And in case you don't know, um, we, we all can, I'm sure, find our way about, around Pompeii and it, with a map, but Herculaneum, I, I think we rarely see a map of. So I, I wanted to include it here. Um, the arrow is pointing to the boathouses. So you may already know, but in the night, early 80s, a skeleton was found near the ancient beachfront. The beachfront is no longer there. It's about 400 feet for 400 yards further out now because of the volcanic debris. But um, most of the people probably ran to the beach thinking that they would escape by boat. And that's where they huddled in those boat houses that you see there with the arrow. And um, Dr. Sarah Beisel enters the picture here. Uh, she was a physical anthropologist uh, funded by National Geographic, she excavated and studied the skeletons found there. She wrote numerous articles, which you can look up. And I mean, she wrote a bunch and books about these findings. 
Um, and the more academic ones explored the bioarchaeology of the skeletons, you know, their diet, their health. But she also wrote um, a wonderful little book called The Secrets of Vesuvius, meant for children. And it, recre it creates a story of how certain people represented by the skeletons that she studied could have interacted in the days uh, before the eruption. It's a great book. Uh, I was super excited to meet her when I went to um, Herculaneum in 1997 and then found out that she had died previously that year of cancer. It was a, very, a devastating loss. Um, not National Geographic subsequently made a documentary about her work called In the Shadow of Vesuvius. It's still to me the best documentary about uh, Vesuvius, in my opinion. And they featured her work in it. And in the segment, she talked about three skeletons which she featured in her book. Um, one of those skeletons was this lady, the ring lady, she's called usually when people talk about her. She was found with uh, the rings on her fingers there and the little uh, jewelry bag near her hip. The little snake bracelets that you see there, beautiful gold, uh, were stolen in a, in a terrible theft in 1990 when thieves tied up guards and broke into the storage room at Herculaneum. And they were missing for decades, but they were recently returned. And I cannot find the article that talked about who returned them and how and whatnot. But one of the interesting things about this documentary is how she, the, Dr. Beisel explains how, what you can learn from a skeleton. Um, most students, children I teach anyway, do not know that you can tell by looking at a skeleton what sex it is how many children a woman has had, diseases and whatnot. So it's really, really instructive. And then the, the other two skeletons that she discussed is just a really poignant um, story about um, a girl who was probably enslaved and a little child that she was literally wrapping her arms around. And of course, you know, many people when they were excavated thought that they were related, but Dr. Beisel was easily able to see that they had not been related. The girl had extreme pulling on her uh, humerus, meaning, and some damage to her teeth that clear evidence that she had been enslaved. And the child had jewelry on. So Dr. Beisel assumed that she was, the baby was probably um, the child that the, the enslaved girl was taken care of. And my students always like to try to figure out, well, you know, if this girl was only, you know, nine or 10, like, why was it her job to take care of this child? And it just leads to some really good conversations about enslaved people and just how families worked at this time in the world. So the skeletons are, have all been removed and cleaned and organized and stored safely away, hopefully. <laughs> but the skeletons, they made uh, plaster casts of them. So now you can, when you go to Herculaneum, you can go to the boathouses. And this is kind of the view that you see, that these are not real. I like to talk to my students though about how would you feel, you know, if we're, would you want to visit this area? in Herculaneum if you got to go? How would you feel about it? Um, how would you feel if, if these were your ancestors, if these were people that you knew? It's a great conversation to have. And you may know that Dr. Stephen Tuck actually has tracked Vesuvian survivors. Um, I've listed an article here for you about his work, very general overview. Um, another person you'll definitely want to check out if you're interested in this topic is Dr. Christina Kilgove. Kilgrove. She's a physical anthropologist and a classical archaeologist who writes about, um, she wrote about the thermal shock issue. Um, and if you can't visit Herculaneum, there's a wonderful walking tour that you can go along with right here. It's, it's a great little video. It, and it's a long video. It's like an hour and a half. So he walks to all the available areas in the city of Herculaneum and gives little history about stuff as he walks along. So that's a nice video to watch. And I'll show little bits and pieces of it with my students. 
So now I'll go back now to the lesson and show y'all where we are here. So we've just finished um, step three. And now we are going to visit with an expert. And of course, I'm lucky in that we have Louisiana State University right here in my town. Uh, Louisiana State University houses or hosts the FACES lab. A FACES lab is a forensic lab that uses digital art and clay to uh, recreate the faces of people who um, have been found without identification. And this year we had um, one of their physical anthropologists come to our class and talk about, you know, what you can learn from a body. Uh, she brought skulls for the kids to look at to see if they could tell the difference between a male and a female. She brought um, pelvis, pelvic bones for them to, to look at and see, you know, the difference. So, um, I know that there are plenty of physical anthropologists out there, though, and if you reached out to them at your local university or your local uh, archaeology, um, every, pretty much every state has a state archaeology department. My, my, <laughs> I'm on a first name basis with the archaeologists. They are always coming out to talk to my students about all kinds of different stuff, so I highly recommend that you do that. I've linked you here to the FACES lab, but you know, you can use any local um, anthropology department to do that. After that, I love having a hands-on activity uh, for my students. And so this one, we uh, created a plaster cast. So I'll just go kind of go through that activity with you. If I can get it to come up here without losing you. So um, I've listed here what you need to do this activity. Let me get it bigger for you. Okay. So um, I used balloons, but you could also use like a plastic glove. Um, it just depends, whatever you want to use. But we filled it with water and then we froze it. So that's the first thing you need to do. Um, so I'll go through the steps with you. I have pictures. <laughs> I'm not going to try to recreate this in live time for you. Uh, we created a my original aim was to create a balloon animal that we were going to freeze and then we were going to lay him to rest. But the balloons that I bought for whatever reason, they just, I don't know, they wouldn't fill with water like I was hoping them to. So we just had a snake that, that's what I called him anyway, that had just eaten something. <laughs> and so his stomach was really big. And um, then we froze him. And then we created our Vesuvian street that had been deluged with volcanic debris. You can go get some pumice from your local gardening store and throw in some charcoal from, I don't know, a fire that we had just built in the shoebox. And then we uh, created a, like I said, a pyrocrast plastic flow. And this is very tricky because you need to use dirt that has a high clay content so that it's sticky and will allow some, um, will stay, will keep the shape that you're building, you know, around this balloon. And then we uh, lay our poor little animal to rest. He died in the eruption of Vesuvius. Make sure to puncture your, either your balloon or your plastic glove before, um, you put your clay on top of him. So here we are quickly covering up our victim with volcanic debris. And you wanna leave this little end out here so that you can find where to pour your plaster. Next, we're gonna pretend to be archeologists or anthropologists and mixed the plaster Make sure that if you mix the plaster, you do it so that it's runny. You do not want the plaster. And I put this in the um, instructions above, but you do not want the plaster that immediately freezes up. So don't, don't buy that one. You want something called DAP. That's what um, construction guys call it. That will uh, not freeze up, um, not get hard really quick. 
And then um, you pour it in there, just like an anthropologist would if they were creating um, the cast. And just keep in mind, your, your balloon has now melted. Okay, so um, the original shape of our snake um, is in there. And then here's our plaster kind of curing. And then here we are excavating the remains of our snake. And here is the final result here. He's coming out. And we cleaned him up as best we could. But this is kind of actually how some of the, the plaster casts do look um, when, <laughs> when they come out. Okay, and so again, the kids understand like, oh yeah, okay, the, any kind of bones, any kind of thing that was in the snake, we can't access it. Um, that's what plaster casts do. They, they do damage the, the body of the person. Can't get to those bones. You can't get to those remains. Um, it does limit the archaeological record. Okay. And then... Um, let me move this out of the way. And then it's time for some reflection. Um, I want my students to reflect on the legacy of using deceased uh, human bodies as entertainment. Um, and I have just a little, um, oops, did it come up? My window's too small, right? Hold on. Hmm, okay, hold on. Let's see why it doesn't want to come out. Let's see, I can open a preview. Look at that, that's Natalie, weird. Natalie, Joseph has yes. a question. He asks, uh, doesn't oh, okay. the ice have to melt out at some point before you pour in the plaster? Oh yeah, absolutely. Which is why I pointed out here that you need to wait until your ice melts. Okay, so i go back up. I think I, I put that in my directions here. Okay, so you want to quickly cover your victim before it starts to melt, okay, so that you tightly pack the clay and the dirt over it. Okay, and then and this is the time where you can mix your plaster, and then you pour it after it's melted. So yes, definitely wait. Okay, I'm trying to get to my review here, y'all. I don't know why it is not letting me pop it out. Oh, here we go. Okay. So I just want the kids to think about some things before, you know, as we close the lesson, stuff such as what traditions do your family or culture have to respect the dead? Um, I make them read this article about this guy who has collected um, indigenous people's remains in America and has sold them to other collectors. So we do a little lesson about how indigenous people in North America respect to their dead. And then we kind of do a comparison of how people in Italy have had these, you know, long traditions of displaying their dead for others to view. Like, for example, St. Catherine of Siena and, of course, the Capuchin uh, friars. They love to look at those pictures. And were the, bottoms, were the bodies of the victims of Vesuvius treated respectfully? And we're, our school is all, I'm sure y'all are too big about citing evidence. So the kids get to write about that. They can cite evidence from the article. And in your opinion, should people be able to view the victims of Vesuvius? And there is, I've linked you here to a lecture by Dr. Laser, who definitely thinks that we should not. Um, she has very strong opinions about this. And then just kind of bringing it home to Baton Rouge, but I know that we're not alone. We have the body of an Egyptian mummy displayed. So, you know, should museums display human remains at all? Um, and if so, you know, a lot of the students will tell me, okay, well, you know, that person is so old, there's no one living that still, you know, remembers that person. Okay, well, if that's your, your marker, then, you know, use that as your evidence to cite your, your opinion. 
And then we finish up the unit with just a little review. It's a little blue kid game about, you know, Dr. Laser and her work with, um, with those skeletons and those bodies and Dr. Beisel's work and whatnot. I'll also point you here, um, I have a long list of resources that you are, you know, free to look through. I have the Dwyer book listed here for you. I have Laser's book, um, some lectures by her, her Pompeii cast uh, project. There's all kinds of little videos here, books. This is a, a wonderful book if you've never seen it, um, Bodies from the Ash by James Dane. It talks about the plaster cast and it's written for kids. And here's Beisel's book, The Secrets of Vesuvius and the National Geographic documentary, um, a lecture by Dr. Mary Mannheim, who, is the, who was for many years the FACES lab director at LSU. You may not know, but um, Lauren Tarshish did a, an I Survived book about the destruction of Pompeii, again, based on some of the skeletons found there. And just some other um, cool stuff that you might be interested in knowing or that your students might want to have to read. Um, and that is the lesson, y'all. And as I said, you know, um, feel free to take what you want, take what you need and add as you go or subtract whatever you feel is necessary. And I think that's it. So I'll take questions if you'll have them. Yeah, feel free to um, unmute yourself and uh, ask Natalie any question that you might have. I have one. What has been the biggest outcome for the students? Like, how have they been changed by all this, you know, actual doing of the project? I don't know. That's a good question. Um, they come up with some really interesting, you know, thoughts about should we be looking at human remains? Um, they have all seen the mummy at this museum in Baton Rouge. And it's kind of like a, before, before COVID shut everything down, they had all been to that museum. Now, not so much. So it's interesting to see how, like sometimes they don't even, they don't even consider these things uh, so young. But to, um, to have them thinking so deeply about it, it's, I think it's a good thing. Well, one of the things I know when I would talk about with the students at the end of stage 12 is so many of them, like, just thought people always were like, they thought of movie kind of sets and they, that you survived or you held your breath and you ran fast and to confront the, the amount of bodies and the way that they can prove that there was that many bodies and, and to have them in the postures, you know, it was an argument for the plaster casts, you know, yeah. even though you are destroying some other kinds of evidence. Yeah. I'll also say that um, reading Laser's work was just so illuminating. I cannot recommend her work enough, y'all. It's a fantastic book. Um, she even criticizes uh, Dr. Sarah Beisel for her book um, that she just very strongly believes we should not be making up stories about, about skeletons, even though there is some you know, archaeological evidence for the story details. She says it's just not, um, it's not ethical. And um, I can see, you know, Beisel was being supported by National Geographic. So, you know, she kind of had to make it into a story. Um, I mean, that's what National Geographic does, right? They make good stories about, about science, about archaeology. And so I think there was that pressure for her. Well, I didn't read the book, but I watched her, um, you know, documentary, and it mm -hmm. seemed like she posed it as supposition, though. I mean, I don't. Yes. Mean, I mean, you know. I like, agree. I I think Laser is very critical, um, almost to the point of being, you know, too critical. Because I think part of inquiry into science, into history, is what do you think it was like, or what do you think happened to this person, or how did they feel? And of course, you have no clue but it brings you into their story, a, a potential story. Yeah, I know, I'm absolutely. not agreeing with you. I'm just commenting out loud. No, no, I, I agree with you. Yeah. 
Yeah. Anybody else have thoughts, comments, observations? Are you guys going to be sharing the recording of the session through the registration system? No, what we do is we put it up on our website, which is cambridgelatin.org under um, training. There's a website, a list of all our webinars. And I will also put it up on our YouTube channel, which you can get to from that same place. It's cambridgelatin.org. Thank the you. Website. There's a lot of good webinars and we had the one that Margaret and Gillis who's here tonight did who has been to Pompeii and given us a couple of tours. So of, you know, lots of things. So well worth checking out. I'll put the link in the, um, Michelle Lassard. Hi, thanks so much. Uh, I'm not going to turn my video on because I am currently sick and just not horribly so gross and miserable. Um, but <laughs> I was really excited to see this presentation and it's been absolutely fascinating because I do a presentation on Pompeii where I have very little time to talk about the cast. It's a visiting lecture. I go and talk to a lot of different schools with it. So in 45, 50 minutes, I'm trying to cover the entirety of Pompeii and Herculaneum. Um, so when I do talk about them, I emphasize the speed of the demise to make it a little bit less gruesome, um, and then the scientific value of the remains. But I worry because it's so abbreviated that I'm not treating the bodies with proper respect. And I was wondering if anyone had suggestions for how I can be modeling that respect for the students, because I don't think they would even notice, oh my goodness, she's being so disrespectful, but that doesn't make it not important. Well, I don't think that you're being disrespectful. I, and I think that a simple, um, you know, warning to the kids, like sometimes, you know, when I take my students to see, when I've taken my students to see the mummy, the, the mummy at our museum is actually, um, is a third century CE mummy. So technically, you know, Roman, Roman period, Egypt. And when we take the kids there, the docent is always um, stops the kids before we enter the, the, the tomb and says, you know, before we go in, let's all remember that we're about to see someone's, a deceased human's remains and that mummy deserves respect. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, there's, you, I think you could easily say something like that before you show pictures of people and remind the students that yes, these people died in a horrible way, but we've learned so much from these skeletons and they have been useful. So That's how I like to do it. Our RT, but my school, interestingly, was situated next to a cemetery. And mm -hmm. um, we would take the kids over to talk about, you know, tombstones and all that, the art teacher and I. And she would always start with a little presentation, just like you said. And at the end, even though these were tombstones and she would say something almost to the effect of thank you for the service you the dead are giving us is how we learn you know like so you know and some kids thought that was odd but you know she just always modeled that i appreciate that we're getting to look at this person's life you know and we weren't seeing the bodies obviously but we're close margaret ann you wanted to pipe in here she had her hand up Hey, <laughs> sorry, actually, um, I think there would be an excellent, excellent compliment to your presentation. Last week on PBS, The Secrets of the Dead, they featured the bodies that have been found in Civita Giuliana, which is about a kilometer north of Pompeii, and they used pouring plaster in the cavity that they found where the bones were. Um, and so that would be a nice tie-in to what you're doing here for the, for the classroom, because it's just a short clip, um, but still very important because we're, we're finding more and more evidence of people outside of the city walls of Pompeii. So that gives us an opportunity to expand the, the conversation as to how many more people could we potentially see? And what does this bring for people? For instance, these bodies were found under the houses 
of the current inhabitants who live in modern Pompeii. And so what responsibilities do we have there to protect then that kind of um, patrimony that we have uh, globally? So I just thought I, I would put that in. And last fall when I was in Herculaneum, they had found another body on the beach. Yes, so that actually, I actually linked y'all to that article in my resources. And Dr. Christina Kilgrove, the one I mentioned, she also talks, she did a whole study of skeletons found at Alplantis, which also, you know, nearby. Um, and yes, there, there you can, there's so much to gain. So I know you said we lose the bones. Has, has there been any studies where they actually break open any of these casts after they, have they made a model of anything or? They don't want to break the casts because they, you know, the casts themselves are a, a part of the archeological record at this point, which is the reason for the scans that they do so that they're not damaging the casts. Okay. Now the casts, the, all of the, cast and... the casts themselves have been casts. You know, right. um, all these traveling things like, you know, there was one in Houston um, this past last summer. Years ago, I took my kids to one in Mobile, Alabama, all of those traveling cast, you know, um, exhibits. They're all casts of the original. Yeah. I they was wondering if they ever like saw that there was something that they had had enough of that they'd be comfortable only having maybe, the cast. Nothing that I've read points to that. Interesting. Hmm. Yes, Joseph, they recast the casts. <laughs> right. uh, now, I don't know if y'all know, but they did try to make um, a plaster cast once, not out of plaster, but out of resin. And yeah. it, it, there are pictures of it online. It's horrifying. Um, it looks like it looks like a human being. Like you can see the bones inside the resin. Yes. The resin's like clear. Yeah, I remember seeing that, yeah. It's very bizarre, but they decided that they only made one of those, I think, because it did not last. Um, they said it was a, a disaster to kind of um, keep as part of the record, so they never did it again. Hmm. Yeah, the, uh, this is Mary Redline. The plaster casts tend to get, like when they age, they get brittle and they yes. can crack. And they had tried those because like if people carried things with them or whatever, like if they, or you had jewelry on it, it wasn't hidden in the plaster. So that mm -hmm. was the thought uh, because I went to both Scorial the one time and I walked from Pompeii to get there and they, the guards were astonished. Like, how did I get there? Cause there was, they didn't hear the car pull in. And of course, then, Signora, I come in out though. The papa, like they were all like flabbergasted. So I wanted, but when I was there, I'll have to look for you online. They have a publication uh, up that I got there uh, on the making of the cats. Okay. Uh, it was and and they have it online. I think I have it on my other computer, but I think it's like an Italian, but. I wanted to buy it. There is an English version of it, and I wanted to buy it. And the guys at the museum at Bosco Real were like, no, no, we don't have it in English. Well, then afterwards, they invited me upstairs. Signora said that the, so they had me sitting down. They could, it was hot. They had the fan blowing on me. And then they did the presentation, and they gave me a copy in Italian for free of the publication and then one on Oplodontus and then they took me back to the workroom and the, the one guy had gone on an ice cream run and brought in the ice cream and everything else. So they left me, they left me stocked with the stuff, but, but that publication is very nice. It would be a, a compliment to your thing. Absolutely, and, I'd love uh, to see. It. Yeah, so I'll try to find the, uh, Maybe there's an online YouTube. version too at this point, you know. Yeah, it they do That's have fine. it online and mm -hmm. so forth. Um, and I, I think of with the bodies, I had one friend, she was uh, a scientist and all her life she worked on doing science. And when she died, she donated her body to medicine so she could still keep teaching after she was gone. <laughs> uh, so there are, you know, questions of like, you know, like, well, 
you know, like people, like if you're doing this uh, for training for medical schools and stuff, they work with cadavers and yeah. so forth. And then after they finish with the bodies, then they, they cremate them and give them back to the right. family if they want to dispose of them. And yeah. I also think too of uh, some other cultures we were talking about, like the bog people that we have found, like where we have people that have been preserved in bogs. Mm -hmm. uh, like as archaeological uh, remains of human beings and what we do with those too. So a very interesting topic. I enjoyed uh, listening tonight. Thank you. Yeah, um, there's a recent article in the New York Times about um, people complaining about their relatives being um, sold in, their bodies being sold to science. Um, and sometimes that's not always, you know, again, what do we do with these bodies? Um, are they being sold to military researchers where they're being shot up, you know, um, disambiguated and shot up? Uh, is that, you know, we don't think about that. You know, we think every body donated to science is going to be on a cadaver table and, you know, surrounded by students who are very careful and, respectful, but that's not always what's done with bodies. And why does that bother us? Does it? Um, so yeah, that's definitely in that scope. And yes, Joseph, I, the body works. Yes, that is an amazing exhibit. <laughs> Highly recommend. Does anybody else have a question or a comment? Well, Natalie, thank you so much. That was that was fascinating, and golly, the amount of work that uh, you put into putting this all together um, is is really incredible. Uh, thank you, thank you. Your your students, um, I'm sure, appreciate it very, very much. Really outstanding. Thank you, thank you for a great presentation. Yes, thank y'all. And hey, Nora, and hey, Steve, and hey, Joseph, good to see y'all. Yeah. All right. And if in uh, this uh, session, as Jenny mentioned, it is being recorded. Uh, the recording will be available at cambridgelatin.org. And if any of you need a professional development certificate, if you would just email us at tra training at cambridgelatin.org, I'll get a certificate to you very quickly. And thank you and good night. Thank you.